Welcome to Celebrating Act Two with our special guest, John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. Hi, John. Hi. Hey, John, uh, I think most people know that uh, the virtual gourmet is a newsletter that you publish weekly, um, as does, well as uh, your writings for various magazines. How do, how do I get that? How do I get the virtual gourmet? Oh, that's funny you should ask. Yeah. I think you need to go to johnmariani.com and sign up. And it's free. Fair charge. Did you know that it's free? I uh, oh every every week I say why is this damn thing free? It's kind of like celebrating Act Two. It is it's right. very very similar. Hey, um, so I I'm a regular reader, um, regular subscriber, and one of the articles recently that you wrote was about. Uh, I always learn something, but it, this was about Johnson's pocket wine book, and of course I had never heard of that before, so I learned a lot about that. But what I wanted to ask you about, it was the editor of the book said that, generally speaking, wines have changed over the years, that people are, that the, the industry, the, people are making wines differently. And mm -hmm. I wanted you to go into that for me. Uh, how true is that, that, uh, and I don't know what period she was talking about, it was, uh, you know, 50 years, mm -hmm. wines are different or what? Oh, less. Things things have changed radically in the last 10 years. Which is why, well, before we get to that book, if you are a real wine lover, the book that you should probably have on your shelf, which is an encyclopedia, which I didn't write. I wrote the Encyclopedia of American Food and Drink, but I have not written um, the Oxford Companion to wine, which is re-edited a new issue every five years, which needs to be. And the one I have on my shelf, which is from 2017, it's already out of date. But fortunately, the only book you, anybody who has a, even a vague interest in wine needs is a handy dandy 2023 edition of Hugh Johnson's Pocket Wine Book, uh, which has a new editor. Um, Hugh Johnson is a, now an elderly man. He's retired from publishing after a lifetime of being the, the finest British wine writer and authority. And after, I don't know, more than 20 years of, of doing this book <clears throat> with other editors, he um, handed it over to Margaret Rand, who is a veteran wine writer. She um, wrote a book called 101 Wines to Try Before You Die. And she's very charming. She's a very British wit. And she writes with an ease that uh, is uh, really, it doesn't copy you, Johnson, uh, who had his own way of saying things, but her own. And um, it's an annual, and I expect the next one will be next year will be. Now, they've sold 12, 000, 12 million copies of these books over the years. So they're wow. very popular. So they have the wherewithal to say, sure, we'll publish another one next year. And people get to throw the old one out. Do you have to? No, no. I mean, if you buy one every five years, you'll be fine. But more so than ever, this particular edition um, has had radical change or talks about radical changes um, because uh, you and I have talked about sustainability, organic, biodynamic, um, and climate change. And um, she treats all of these and... Uh, I'm going to go through, I'm glancing over at, uh, at the page here. Wine styles are changing. This is not some ap apocalyptic warning, just fact. Wine does not taste the way it used to. And what she means by that is that even 10 years ago, if you buy a bottle of Burgundy, it's going to taste like a Burgundy. If you buy a bottle of Bordeaux, oh, that's, that's a Bordeaux, that's not a Burgundy. That's a Cabernet Sauvignon-based wine, and Burgundy is a Pinot Noir wine. California, oh, those big Cabernets out of Napa Valley. Well, all bets are off at this point, um, not only because the world of wine has expanded, but because, as we've talked many times in this show, so I won't repeat myself, global warming has changed everything. And she says, and she says this is not a, 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 a warning, this is a fact. Um, degrees have gone up in the vineyards as much as any place else and this is good for some places that don't get a lot of sun and heat because it builds up the sugars which turns into alcohol but for places that 
do have plenty of sunshine like California and southern Italy and, and Spain. Um, this changes the um, uh, agenda for the future. These wines will taste differently. They will taste flabby birds. They have to work um, to uh, sustain the vineyards, uh, to keep out pests, to trim, uh, to make sure that um, phylloxera does not come and devastate the uh, vineyards. These are all challenges uh, that they have. So that she says, for instance, the Cote de Burgundy wines in most years now taste far more opulent than it used to, which is not a bad thing for Burgundy. Um, Saint-Emilion can sometimes be more reminiscent of Tuscany. <clears throat> Saint-Emilion is in France, Tuscany is further south, it's starting to taste the same. Barolo is more uh, uh, um, affordable than ever because another change, she speaks, is more people are getting into it. So there are winemakers who said, my grandfather made these wines this way, and I had a fight with him and my father to modernize. And that means, first of all, modernize the winery, the technology, get state-of-the-art machinery, um, vats, get rid of the old vats we've used for 100 years, use stainless steel, fermentation tanks. Um, that is, is a, a big game changer. So you get, you're getting wonderful wines from South America, certainly from New Zealand and Australia, um, South Africa, Israel. You're even getting it from, from places like New Mexico. Uh, almost anywhere that the soil is adaptable um, in some way, I mean, you're not going to grow grapes in the middle of the Sahara Desert, but Morocco, northern Africa, produces some creditable wines. And all the talk of the past couple of years has been something that was unthinkable 10 years ago, laughed at English wines, because English vineyards would were too cold, just to the kind of like New York State. Um, you're not going to get very good wine, but hmm, things have been warming up. So English wines uh, are getting better. Um, she says that most of us don't want to buy wines at the highest price points and can't afford to. So her book, Hugh Johnson's uh, 2023 Guide, uh, focuses a great, great deal and is very, very uh, much um, uh, att attends to the average wine drinker who is not going to drink even a $20 bottle of wine every night. But if you're in the 11 12 15 dollar range she's going to tell you some terrific chenin blancs coming out of the loire valley she's going to be t telling you about some really remarkable uh, uh well uh priced wines out of uruguay and uh even brazil and certainly argentina um, and things you might just want to try maybe from lebanon um and hungary and romania um they're not great wines but they're good wines, they're solidly made, solidly knit, <clears throat> and they're not gonna cost you north of $15. So all of these things are what, uh, uh, she, she says at the end, <clears throat> we are increasingly focusing on producers rather than regions, because we believe that is what matters most now. So regional style can have an influence, of course, but it's the name of the producer <clears throat> that distinguishes the best of the mediocre. Amazing how that one little book could be so influential. Great information, John. Appreciate it. It is. I, I should say that this one little book is 337 pages, but it's printed on like Bible paper, thin, very thin paper. It's a great buy. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.